How many of you think about sex a lot? Most of you. Um, why do you think about sex, or we think about sex a lot? And it's not, you know, it's okay. Most enjoyable thing. You always give your advice. My name is Nick. Yeah, I think it's the most enjoyable thing I've found to do on this episode. <laughs> to think about it or to do it? Yeah, and that's why I think about it. And that's why I think about it. Um, why do you think it's enjoyable? It's good. <laughs> let's, let's try this. What do you call your ancestors who did not think about sex? Dead. They're not your ancestors. So, what's the connection? Those people who happen to have the genes that made you think about sex for whatever reason <coughs> would probably invest more of their time and effort and energy into pursuing whatever, let's call it sex, and we're more likely to contribute to future generations, to leave their genes behind. What do we call this process? Natural selection. Natural selection. Does that mean you're trying to pass on your genes? Not overtly. You don't know. You're just doing what you are programmed to do. Why should we have sex? Why don't we just be like yeast and butt? You know, pop off a new youngster from our shoulder. Yes, ma'am, please give your name. Ikea, isn't it a natural instinct? I mean, even though... Ooh, you bet. I have a, a, a very good friend, Dr. Paul Watson, of the University of New Mexico, or New Mexico State. A very, very interesting evolutionary biologist, and he works on uh, natural selection in spiders. And you might think this is crazy, but it's a fantastic area to look at and to work. And if any of you are, might be interested in this, talk to me, and I'll tell you how you can take a course, even this summer, from Dr. Watson. But the idea is the spiders are completely programmed all about what's called fitness. Fitness is how many surviving offspring you generate. And it's a very complicated and wonderful thing. But he is very interested in the human implications of our past evolutionary process on us. And many people would say, I think one of the earlier speakers would say, that I'm doing what I want to do. But if you are to have true freedom according to my friend Paul, in your talking, in your discussion, in your thinking, you have to realize that you are not free if you're just listening to your subconscious. If you're just doing what you want to do, you're not doing what you really want to do, you're doing what you're programmed to do through natural selection. You're hardwired to be interested in doing certain things. And that's fine, because they have contributed to survival in the past. Now, of course, massive reproduction, which was very helpful for our ancestors, are not necessarily so helpful today in a world where many of us think uh, the world is greatly <coughs> overpopulated. The environment has changed. But I want to leave you with this message. If you really want to have true freedom, you must not simply do what your body and your genes are telling you to do. You have to think your way around it a little bit more. That's why a lot of people end up with marriages and kids much too early in life. Because they don't think through what's happening. But I want to go back and, and that was what your question made me want to talk about. But I want to go back and ask more generally, why sex? Why do we have sex? to increase the variability of our offspring. Why should there be a reason? Why should there be selection for variability in our offspring, in any creature's offspring? Yes, sir. 
Maybe. Mike, genetic variability increases the adaptability to the changing environment. That's pretty good. That's good. If you increase your variability and if the environment changes, then you've got more possibilities to choose from, that to be survived or not to survive. All right? You could probably say that a little bit better, Mike, but that's, that's right, getting right there. Okay. Okay, the reason we have sex is that there has been selection for sex. If you look at s simple animals, relatively simple animals, paramecium and yeast, although they're not exactly animals, but organisms, shall we say, often they reproduce sexually. And we think, I'm sorry, asexually, without sex. And we think the earliest organisms probably did not have sex, but we don't know. But once sex gets started, where genes are exchanged, there seems to have been very strong selection for it because the overwhelming uh, dominance of organisms on the face of species on the face of this planet reproduce sexually. And the reason they reproduce sexually is this increases the variability, which is especially important, as Mike says, when the environment changes. So, for example, if we have global warming, those trees that by chance happen to have a physiology that does better in warmer weather are probably going to be encouraged, probably are more likely to survive and reproduce than those organisms that are adapted to <coughs> the Syracuse winters of the past if we have global warming. Now, let's go into this in more detail, but that's the basic idea. Why are you thinking about sex? Because you are programmed to think about sex. Why sex in the first place? Because it increases genetic variability, and this increased genetic variability has produced offspring in the past that were more likely to survive and reproduce, that is to be what we call fit, to have fitness. Let's think, though, about what I think is an irrefutable argument for, logical argument, for the existence of natural selection. The first thing you need to know is that there is variability in nature. You are part of nature. Look around the room, right? Now look around the room. There's variability amongst the genomes that are here in this room. Now, it turns out that in humans, although we may think we look different to each other, and all kinds of strange and wonderful and horrible things are a consequence of that, we actually are all very, very similar as organisms go. There is more genetic variability in a troop, meaning a family group, of 30 or so lowland gorillas than there is in all of the humans on this planet. We're all very similar. This has led to what's called the Eve hypothesis, that we all have one great-great-great-grandmother at one point in time. That may be true, but we're all enormously similar compared to the variability you'll find in most other populations. I think only a few organisms, such as cheetahs, have as little variability as there is in this room and, in fact, in all humans on the Earth. We're genetically very similar. Why? Probably because at one time there were very few <coughs> ancestors for all of us who left their genes overwhelmingly for who we are. So the first point I am making here is there is variability in nature even amongst this relatively unvariable species, Homo sapiens, there is a lot of variability. Number two, the variability is inherited, at least in part. I assume all of you realize that you look more like your parents than your best friend's parents or other people's parents, to some degree, not perfectly, but to some large degree. 
So it's obvious, isn't it, that this is heritable. And certainly corn breeders know this and so forth. Now, the third issue doesn't apply at the moment as much to humans. But the third issue is if there is differential survival and reproductive potential <coughs> within this heritable, within this diversity of organisms within a species, there will be natural selection and there will be, in time, evolution. If evolution does not occur, then one of those three tenets, one of those three basic things must be incorrect. And I don't know which of them it would be. So this is to say that logically, evolution and natural selection must occur based on the very simplest of observations around us. I believe that Charles Darwin was the most important scientist, perhaps the most important human being that has been on this planet. His ideas were incredible. <coughs> and the reason that Charles Darwin is so important to us now is one, he stumbled onto an incredibly important concept. And number two, he was a wonderful, wonderful scientist. And the third thing I'd like to say was he was a pretty decent human being. There's a lot of people that are great scientists that were really not very pleasant people. Charles Darwin perhaps had a few flaws, but he was basically a caring and a very fair person. Uh, and he understood the difficulty of what he said. Now, you have to understand the world into which Charles Darwin was born. The world into which Charles Darwin was born basically had no word for what we call evolution, or specifically organic evolution. Evolution, incidentally, means simply gradual change. Organic evolution means gradual change of living beings. A rapid change is called a revolution. Okay? Evolution is gradual change. So what is it about Charles Darwin that led him to this incredible discovery that he had. Okay, first of all, part of it was the times in which he lived and the place in which he lived. He was the son of a wealthy doctor and a wealthy, uh, and a, his grandfather also uh, was a very important writer and I believe also a physician, but his father was an important physician, uh, very well respected. And he grew up as a kind of a uh, English twit playboy, mostly interested in going out with a shotgun and murdering everything he could find and eating it, probably not unlike some kids in this room, including myself. Um, and so basically he was interested in the good life of an English country squire uh, doing a lot of hunting and um, just wandering around in nature in general. But he was curious. He was curious. There was discussion as to whether he would go into the ministry, and there was some discussion as to whether he might be a physician. But he didn't care too much. He was just having a good time. Now, the world in which he lived was a world in which there was no evolution, hardly of anything, socially, certainly biologically. <coughs> the world had been formed by God, whom he believed in as a child, and everybody around him did, and you went to church, and that was where you sought truth. The, the minister would give the truth from the pulpit um, on Sunday. And that was how they would live their lives, very much in some accordance to what they learned in church on Sunday, and incidentally, not a bad idea. Now, when he was just graduated from college, not much older than you, an incredible opportunity 
came to him. There was a ship that was going to go around the world and undertake basically um, marine uh, mapping all around the world. And it was being done, it was financed by the British government. This ship, which is called the Beagle, <coughs> a good name for the ship, Beagle. Why is it a good name? What's a beagle? A hunting dog. It's a dog that sniffs things out, right? And follows leads and so forth. I had a beagle when I was a kid. Great dog. So, uh, the ship was the beagle. Darwin was not the first choice of naturalists, but the second. Thankfully, he was appointed. And Darwin was brought there not really to be a naturalist, but to be the companion, a gentleman companion for the uh, captain. The captain was a gentleman, meaning uh, a, a person of education and uh, some financial means. And it was not normally considered that gentlemen would mix with the hoi polloi, meaning the guys that were running the ship, running up and down the rigging and so forth, the sailors. There was this separation. So the captain wanted somebody to talk to, and uh, Charles Darwin was appointed to that. Now, it turned out to be an incredible opportunity for Charles Darwin because the Beagle sailed around the world going initially to South America <coughs> and uh, Darwin especially spent a lot of uh, time horseback riding and exploring in Patagonia, that is southern uh, Argentina in Chile. Incidentally, my favorite part of the world. And he did many things there, for example, to find some extraordinary dinosaur bones. At that time, people thought dinosaurs were left over from the biblical flood, as did Charles Darwin at that time. That when the big flood came, these guys were drowned and buried in the sediments. It all made sense to them. Now, he was only to be away for several years. He was nearly engaged to be married. Uh, he was, in fact, away for nearly six years. And it was an extraordinary journey. And Darwin really got into it. And he became an incredible collector. A collector of plants, of marine organisms, of birds with a shotgun, of just about whatever. And he traveled and he wrote up uh, his book, The Voyage of the Beagle, is an incredible adventure story. He's a good writer and uh, he was a fun guy, I think, probably. He was probably pretty bloody interesting to have around as your companion. And he was extraordinarily intellectually curious. Everything he saw, he wanted to know about. The people, the cultures, the plants, the animals, whatever. And he said later in his life, the happiest days of his life was when he was living with the gauchos, who were kind of poor cowboys living in Argentina. And he was quite a horseback rider. Uh, almost was killed by bandits several times. It was very adventuresome, uh, very interesting life at that time. <coughs> now, Darwin traveled all the way around the world. While he's doing that, the Beagle and its crew is mapping the, the different, um, different coastal regions that it was encountering. So, for example, if you go down to uh, Patagonia, to the south, southern part of Patagonia, there's an island down there, Tierra del Fuego, the land of fire, which there were people living there that Darwin met and interviewed and so forth. Um, and there's a called the Beagle Beagle in Spanish. Probably didn't pronounce that too right, too correctly. But channel there, uh, and it was really interesting for me to be on a ship out in that channel, looking at areas that Charles Darwin had been, and thinking how what Charles Darwin must have been thinking when he was looking at these incredible areas. The most important thing happened when Charles Darwin went to the Galapagos Islands, 
which are now part of Ecuador. And while he was there, he observed birds that were living there that are called now Darwin's finches. And there's a group of, I don't know, a dozen or 15 islands in the Galapagos. Uh, incidentally, doc, Dr. Gibbs of this school has done a lot of important research there and is fascinating. He teaches conservation <laughs> biology, works a lot on conservation of the Galapagos, and he has fascinating stories about his own work there uh, in the footsteps of Darwin. But the thing he noticed was that there were bird species there, different species, that looked very, very similar, except that they had different sized bills. And using these different bills, they had different ways of making a living. Now, for example, there were some that would have large bills and would crush large seeds. There were some that had small bills and they would eat insects, for example, this one would peck out little seeds around the ground and so forth. One of them even had, would take a cactus thorn in its beak and probe in the manner of a woodpecker. But they were so, so similar that Darwin said, how, how come they're so similar, but they have <coughs> such different beaks and they do such different things with their lifestyle? And that started him thinking. And of course, we today understand what Darwin figured out, but you have to realize nobody had a clue what might be going on at that time. It's not fair to say nobody. There were some other people that were thinking along the, side, the lines of evolution. Um, a guy named Matthew wrote a very nice, uh, uh, a naval architect talked about how trees would grow according to the principles of natural selection, but nobody was reading it. Darwin's grandfather had actually written about evolution as a philosopher. And this is the page from Darwin's notebook that started it all. And the important thing that he's dealing with here is what we call common descent. That there was some common ancestor, let's call it a species, that over time different groups of them would change into other species, would evolve into other species, and those further into other species. <coughs> well, Darwin figured this out. I believe that page in his notebook is from 1937. And he figured that out in 1937, but he didn't really understand what it meant. Now, many of you want to be scientists, and the first thing I want to tell you is that the most important attribute of a good scientist is observation. And Darwin was incredible at observing many, many, many things. And he sent back cases and cases and cases of stuffed animals and, and uh, animals in bottles and plants all pressed up and so forth to people in England who were specialists, and they would all look at this. And one of the amazing things was that he found that for some other birds, but we could say it's for these Darwin finches, the ornithologists of England said, hey, these are separate species. They have all the attributes that they would use at that time to classify things as separate species. That was astonishing. Darwin came home and married Emma Wedgwood, which is also an important component of his success. What does the name Wedgwood mean? 
fine china. So uh, her uh, uncle and, and grandfather had invented the process of making fine china in England, and had made a fortune. So this meant that Darwin had leisure. Now, as far as I can tell, since he came back from the, Dar from the Beagle, he essentially never goofed off again. But he had the time to sit down and think and write. And he wrote and wrote and wrote about what he had found, published these big, beautifully <coughs> illustrated uh, journals of what he had found when he was traveling around the world. And then he, in his life, just to tell you, he wrote the definitive work on how coral reefs were formed, the definitive work on the importance of earthworms, the definitive uh, book on the reproduction of orchids, uh, a definitive book on barnacles. All of these things he was fascinated with. And he was such a keen observer that he formed the basis of all of our later work of thinking about these different things that Charles Darwin was fascinated with. I found him an incredible person. But he had a problem. And the problem was, A, initially, he was religious and believed in the Bible, in the words of Genesis. And a more important problem over his life was that his wife, whom he was very fond of, um, was very much a traditional Christian. Now, let me make this very clear to those of you who might uh, find this a conflict in your own minds. I see no conflict myself between Genesis and what we have learned from science. If, you say, God has long days. The sequence in Genesis is about right. Uh, there's no problem, really, with it. Now, maybe there's a problem with, maybe the bigger problem is whether we are here by chance or design. And um, I have no clue. Science is not able to answer that question. It's not interested in that question. Because it's a, in order for science to operate, you have to have a control. And if God is everywhere, you can have no control. So it's out of the realm of science to test for those sorts of things. That's up to you. Um, I have my own opinions, but that's not important to this class. Um, maybe something is important to this class is to think about the power of science to come to conclusions that people were not able to come to when early parts of our culture evolved. I find this an interesting article. The Vatican's position evolves. The Roman Catholic Church has never had an argument with Darwin or with evolution, as far as I can tell, at least officially. But they blew it big time in the past. Anybody know what that was about? Copernicus and the sun revolving around the earth. Well, okay, in Galileo. They excommunicated Galileo for saying that the earth revolved around the sun. Now, we have uh, lots of evidence now to the contrary. So, since then, the uh, Catholic Church has gone quite, quite uh, carefully in, officially, in where, what it says relative to science. Um, that's not true for all of our uh, religious sex, of course. Um, Darwin felt it went something like this after he thought about it a lot. These are the Dar Darwin's finches, and he said this must have been what happened. That we had a common ancestor. The common ancestor probably was blown from the mainland where there are similar finches to the Galapagos, probably to one of the Galapagos, where it found uh, other, lots of things to eat and a few other birds, probably a lot of reproduction, and then periodically a storm or uh, adventuresome bird or something would go to another one of the islands, have to have two of them, or at least a pregnant female, where they would find different environmental conditions. And under those circumstances then, those birds would evolve into other birds. And this is what Darwin concluded. And that was the basis. And then he looked around him and gathered a great deal of information. And he found these kinds of things. For example, 
He spent a lot of time, being a country gentleman, talking with breeders of plants and animals in England, especially of animals, who were very, very interested in getting faster racehorses, um, more productive cows, better tasting sheep, or whatever, or woollier sheep, whatever they were looking for. And they, these people often kept very, very careful records. And from these careful records, he could find out that what a sheep was or what a cow was had changed dramatically due to the selective breeding of the breeder. So he became aware that not due to natural selection, but due to human selection, evolution or gradual changing of domestic plants and animals was occurring all the time. And in fact, it was the basis of much of the agriculture of England and also horticulture. For example, people who were breeding beautiful orchids were very much aware of these kinds of things. Now, the problem that Darwin had was that the young didn't exactly <coughs> mimic, did not exactly look like or act like necessarily their parents. There was this variation. And he, to the end of his life, he could not figure out what was going on. He talked a lot about maybe the gene somehow blended. I, he had the word gene, but he didn't really know what it meant like we do. That there would be a blending of traits. <coughs> But as many of you probably know, you can have two brown-eyed parents and you can be blue-eyed or the converse. Um, and the trick to understanding this was an understanding of the prospect of the situation of Mendelian genetics. Gregor Mendel was a monk who lived in um, Austria. Uh, and very carefully observed. Again, he observed and he observed and he observed. And then he did some clever experiments. You have to realize that Darwin really wasn't an experimental scientist, although, except if we think about this uh, animal breeding. So what Mendel did was he took peas and he bred two parent peas and looked at the offspring and he found out what you're going to learn in your genetics or your biology classes if you don't know already that the way the genes combine can give you something that might look very much like the parent or maybe something that looks very different and it's very very repeatable which is the important issue of science the important issue of science is especially repeatability and also the mechanism that gives you what you see so Darwin spent more than 20 years from coming back from the Beagle trying to build his case, trying to argue well what was going on. And he got in the mail one day something that made a tremendous difference. He got a manuscript from this other incredible explorer, Alfred Russell Wallace. This came and Darwin said, oops, oops. Now here is one evidence of how, what a good guy he was. Wallace was at that time off in Indonesia, collecting and doing more botanical and zoological collecting. And what Darwin did was he said, ah, uh, I better get with it, I better publish or at least make public what I'm thinking about. And he arranged for Darwin's, for Wallace's paper to be read and for him to read or his paper to be read simultaneously before the Royal Society of Science. In other words, he could have just stuck Wallace's envelope in a drawer and gone ahead to get all the glory for himself. He didn't do that. And I think that's a, a good sign, one of many this was a, a very decent person. And in fact, Wallace had come up with the same thing. Again, the important issue, it's not just evolution, but it's a evolution <coughs> by natural selection. And the basic idea here of natural selection is this. Darwin observed 
that nature produces a tremendous surplus of individuals. That most organisms, think of the robin hood oak over there. You go by there in the fall when it's producing acorns, and there's tens of thousands of acorns, only one of which every 200 years will grow up to be a robin hood oak. Right? And that's true everywhere. You have a big codfish, it'll lay 10 million eggs. So the codfish have the potential to take over the seas, but they don't. The reason is most of those eggs will not make it to the adult. Giving the option, giving the opportunity for the environment to operate on all those little codfish, culling them, getting rid of most of them, being eaten, dying from disease or whatever. In only those that have everything it takes to be a codfish in the environment in which they grow up are probably going to be the ones that survive into adult big codfish producing again tens of millions of eggs. So this was the idea that natural selection would cause the genetic makeup of organisms to change over time. And this is the basis of both Alfred Russell Wallace's and Darwin's, Charles Darwin's ideas. Darwin then, quite soon after, published his book on the origin of species. And it was recognized at that time the tremendous intellectual importance of what he had said. It was also important because there had been geologists Hutton and Lyell, a little bit before him, who were able to talk about the very, very old age of the Earth. Instead of the Earth being 8,000 years old, little years old, as the Bible had said, the Earth was, in fact, many, many millions, even billions of years old. And this idea of uniformitism in geology, that, that the processes you see operating now operated in the past. That a river valley was eroded over long periods of time by a river, rather than the river flowing down a pre-existing valley. All of these ideas were coming together, and it was a great deal of controversy. And intellectual turmoil. It must have been very, very exciting. Uh, Alfred Russell Wallace published his idea, ideas in a book a little bit later. He was also, in my opinion, very generous, giving Darwin, who had really accumulated far more evidence, uh, the, the primary place <coughs> in understanding evolution. Uh, Darwin was greatly helped by this fellow Huxley called Darwin's Bulldog. Huxley was uh, very much uh, a proponent and a very articulate proponent of Darwin's ideas. It's not always the originators of good ideas, of great ideas, that bring them to the world. Sometimes you need a communicator. I suspect some of you will be great environmental communicators eventually, uh, taking ideas, perhaps some learned in this class, and bringing them to the broader world. Um, later, Darwin um, included humans in later versions. And he wrote a book called The Descent of Man. Interestingly, not the ascent of man, but the descent through evolutionary time of humans. And Darwin began a remarkable transformation in our understanding of human beings, at least in the Western world, that humans are not special, but the end product of a series of evolutionary accidents, which we will talk about. Um, at least that's one way one can think about it, certainly how Darwin thought about it. Um, and every, every year, every month, every day, we find more and more evidence in the fossil record, especially as we're now exploring the fantastic 
geological reserves of China. You're finding so much new information that helps us to understand what used to be called missing links. People said when Darwin first came out, there was no missing link between apes and humans. Well, first of all, there can't be any missing links between apes and humans because humans did not evolve from apes. They both evolved from a common ancestor. And now we have so many intermediate species between our early ancestors and who we are, where we found the bones, which I have seen with my own eyes in particular exhibits and in museums. And because I'm a biologist, I can get into some of the neat labs where they have some of this information. Um, any of you are ever in New Haven, go to the Peabody Museum. It's not about humans particularly. I don't believe anybody can walk into the Peabody Museum in five minutes there and not believe in evolution, but you're welcome to try. It's astonishing to see. 